All right, we'll go ahead and get started on today's webinar, Proposals That Stand Out, Adding Financial Illustrations to Blended Gift Requests. We will be recording today's session and we'll send the recording along with the slide deck and answers to any questions that come through the Q&A following the session. That said, if you do have any questions that come up throughout today's presentation, please put them in the Q&A function. Our colleagues will do their best to respond to questions in the moment, but we promise to send thoughtful responses following the session so everyone can learn more together. In today's session, we are providing tools and tips to prepare a proposal that includes gift illustration options for your donors. We will be utilizing a case study to demonstrate how this can work with a variety of gift vehicles. This session does assume that your donor is already interested in learning more about planned gifts and gifts of non-cash assets and how they might benefit both the donor and the organization. The session is not a session on financial calculations, nor, it is, a, nor is it a guide on how to use gift planning software. Today, I am joined by my wonderful colleague, Christiana Robertson. Christiana is based in Phoenix and has spent nine years at CCS. She is currently working at Honor Health, a healthcare system in Phoenix. Christiana also helps to lead our gift planning practice group within CCS fundraising. And I'm Hannah Yartz. I'm a Denver-based senior vice president with, C with CCS fundraising. I've spent 11 years with CCS and have had the honor of working across sectors. I'm currently working with the San Diego History Center and internally help to lead our firm's gift planning practice group. A little about CCS. Uh, what I love about working at CCS is that we really strive to work, understand the unique needs of each nonprofit we partner with. We work together to develop solutions based on their needs and their greater vision for impact. We provide a variety of services, and the next slide shows just a snapshot of some of those services that we provide to our nonprofit partners, many of whom are on today's webinar. So thank you for joining us today. And the next slide shows just a glimpse of some of the amazing organizations we work with. Every year we work with over 600 unique nonprofits to support their missions. Christiana is going to take us through an overview of blended gift requests and illustrations before we go into our case study. Well, welcome everyone. Like Hannah said, we are so glad that you chose to be with us today. Um, we actually had a chance to present a version of this presentation at the National Association of Charitable Gift Planners this past year. So we are very pleased to have made some edits and do a reprisal here for all of you. Uh, we wanted to start out with just an overview of blended gift requests, and primarily we are seeing a lot of these be used across our clients because they're incredibly flexible um, and they help a donor really start to explore what they might have to give um, and what they might want to do, whether it's a capital campaign or, you know, a principal gift ask. Um, it's, a, it's a very effective tool for our clients to articulate, you know, the current needs of their organization but also to bring in that vision and that inspiration for their prospective donors on how they can make an impact. We like to say that these types of proposals need to answer what's going to be different if the prospect chooses to partner with this organization and make a gift. Um, to, to do this, you know, we really get started by looking at um, a lot of different demographics. And, and we hope that when we make these gift requests, that they help donors to make aspirational gifts. They can stretch further in their giving. Um, there's a lot of tax benefits that can be outlined in a, in a blended gift proposal. And so really putting these proposals together, I think of them like a puzzle. We're looking at, in this case, four really big tranches of thought. Um, and we look at our donors each individually. Every prospect is their own individual effort, their own individual campaign, if you will. Um, and so we start out at a very high level saying, okay, who has affinity for this client's mission, for our mission? Who has ability to make a gift of some, of some importance? And who do we have access to? And once we've kind of narrowed the field and we have probably a pretty robust list of prospective donors, 
we can narrow things further to really get precise in what we put in front of donors for their consideration. We don't just want a one size fits all blended gift proposal. So of course there's those key demographics. All of you on the call are probably very familiar with these, right? Do they have children? Are they married? What sort of publicly available data can we find in terms of their gener generous giving to other organizations, their capacity to give to us and to others? We take all of that into account. And of course we leave a margin for error knowing that we don't have total insight into someone's financial picture, but these can be helpful guides along the journey. Um, one thing that I think is really under talked about, but very powerful in terms of timing and what type of a potential gift you put in front of your donor is what's happening in their lives. A lot of times life events are really taxable events. They're transitions. There's a lot of emotion connected to these types of events. And surprisingly, gift planning, non-cash giving in particular, can be really sometimes helpful as people are going through life stages. So think about retirement. If someone's thinking about you know, transitioning, they have an IRA, a 401k, they maybe are selling a business. Those are all big things that they need to consider. And making a charitable gift is truly probably quite helpful to them in that process. They're able to give to an organization that they love as opposed to pay taxes. So we wanna watch what's happening in their lives. We wanna watch their age, those key demographics, two pieces of the puzzle. And then we wanna look at what we know in terms of what they have. Maybe they've talked to us in conversation. We've heard from prospecting sessions with other board members or other donors. Um, and we can kind of think about, do they own a business? Do we know that they have you know, some sort of retirement assets because they worked for this type of a company? That's just another tick um, in terms of how we think about putting together a proposal. And then we, we kind of start putting those pieces together and we say, is this type of a, a prospective donor going to benefit most from maybe a deferred gift or a split interest gift? And it really depends on what we know that they have or, or what we're pretty sure that they have. Um, and we can put together a really good illustration that kind of casts vision that they can then go to their financial planner and talk through very specific numbers because we don't want to be in the, in the hot seat of providing tax advice. I really love this slide um, because I, I think it democratizes philanthropy. So it really just makes the case that everybody at every life stage can be an impactful donor to your organization. And this work uh, really was kickstarted by the Leaving a Legacy report in 2019 that Giving USA published. I hope they do another version of that report. If you haven't read it, check it out. Um, but we've even had a pandemic since this slide was put together. Um, but I look at this as someone who's in my late 30s, going into my 40s, and I say, you know what? It's true. I just got married, and my husband and I could be asked to leave, you know, an organization in our will. We're young. We might not have the IRA giving capacity, but it doesn't mean that we don't have something that could be added to a blended gift proposal for our consideration. Of course, when you get to some of those later years and you start putting together those pieces of what do we know this donor values and needs and wants for their legacy, you can ask for different types of gifts, but leave no one out. Um, think of everyone as a potential donor and don't, don't leave out the, the young people, right? When people have children, those life events trigger them to say, oh my goodness, we need a will. They bought a house, we need a will. Um, so really take advantage of everyone and continue to cultivate. This slide is, um, it's, it's been a good chart for me to use to look at um, what I would want for my donor versus from my donors. So we want our donors to be united in their giving if they have a spouse. We want them to feel proud of their gift. We want them to feel like they're making an impact, that they're doing something that's gonna make something else different. Outcomes types of asks versus needs types of asks. And this is just to kind of show you that you don't need to know everything. You just need to know enough to prompt thought for people and to initiate an idea for them as to a type of a path that they might go down and explore with their financial planner. So again, you take some of those things that you know about your donor and you look at this, you say, okay, is their goal to avoid capital gains taxes? Then you can triage and you can go out from there. Again, working with some of that information that you've known about them because you've gotten to know them, hopefully primarily through conversations with them. Um, if this is a helpful cheat sheet for you, 
print it out of our slide deck, use it. If you have things to add to it, send it to us. We're, we'd love to keep making this a stronger piece. I like talking points, um, and I think they're helpful to offer um, to folks as well. So when you're in conversation with a donor, these are some questions that we've actually sourced from clients over the years and that we've seen in practice. Hannah and I have done a lot of gift proposals um, for our clients and blended gift. And these are some of the things that we help to train their major gift fundraising team to ask, to listen for. Um, and I think there's a bit of a myth that people think you're going to be nosy. And that's that's really not what we see. People appreciate being known and they appreciate being cared about. And so when you're asking them things about what motivated you to do this, what do you hope to accomplish? What are some of your goals? What really brings you joy? That's bringing dignity to that donor to say, we want to know you. We want to partner with you in a way that's not just going to be us asking because we have a need, but that we're asking because there's a chance for us together to do something bigger than we can on our own. So pin these, practice them so they come off your tongue quickly, and feel free to share them with your team. Um, a lot of times we have to be prepared for what donors are going to say in conversation. And so um, we, see, we see these quite frequently, right? People will say, well, I'm concerned I'll outlive my money or, well, we really have a priority of providing for our grandchildren's education. And these are all valuable things that we want to help them along in their process. But again, those life events, those goals can often be either A, accomplished, even if they make a gift to our organization, or B, those goals can be assisted through a charitable gift. And that's where you just need to know enough to say, have you ever thought about this? Or have you ever talked to your financial planner about that? Or, you know, I saw from somebody else, a donor of ours, they made a gift like this and it helped them to do this and this. They were able to accomplish both their goals. It's, it's just having really thoughtful responses to legitimate, reasonable concerns as donors figure out what they want to do and be. All right. The good stuff. Let's talk about gift illustrations. Um, there are a couple ways that you can do this. Like Hannah said, this isn't a class where we're going to teach you math, but um, we want to think about our blended gift proposals kind of from these big four areas, right? It should have, it should have these sections laid out for donors to walk them through. So of course, your current needs, fill them in on your mission. How did you get here? Why is now the time for what you're asking them to consider? How does this relate to your mission? It always has to go back to your North Star. Um, then put in some of these really tactical components and illustration being one of them that they can take to their financial planner and have a more robust conversation. It is great if you can go to that conversation with their financial planner. One thing we encourage our clients is you don't just kind of drop your, drop your donor off at the bus and say, I hope it goes well, have a good conversation. But this is a relational exercise. So the more that you can go with them to say, I know I know a little bit here and I can certainly share what I've seen others do, but I'd love to, I'd love to go and just explore with you um, together if you're open to that. Um, and then of course, reiterate that gift impact clearly and concisely. What will be different if this donor makes the gift that you're asking them to make? Um, there really are a couple ways that you can do your illustrations. I've had great success, particularly within the healthcare sector, putting these in. Um, a lot of times we outline what's the benefit of just cash, cash plus perhaps a charitable remainder trust, cash, cash plus or a charitable lead trust. We show them that flip um, and that can be really helpful. But but really, it's just to cast vision. It's help helping the donor think about I've got the missional components of this proposal. I have my love for this organization. And now I have a logical um, ask in front of me that I said that I can say, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know I could do this or I could do more than I wanted to or it's easier than I expected. That's really what you're trying to convey through these illustrations. Um, you're not trying to lock in a very precise number in tax savings. That's that's not the goal at this stage of the game. Here's um, here's an example of, of an illustration. So really two ways that you can do this. The first being software supported. And this is the way that I've primarily done them just because you get just a bit more precision. Um, and there are some really good um, software providers. Um, you can look at, I know PG Calc is one, Advices are, is another one. 
Um, and then honestly, if you just want to poke around on some larger websites, like a university's website, for example, a lot of them have gift calculators just out there for their donors to kind of explore. Um, but this is one of those types of, of illustrations where, um, and it was an example that I used in the healthcare field when I was working with a hospital in Washington, where we showed this donor was very open to giving us a million dollars over five years. But I knew that the donor, he had already provided for his children. I knew that they had already bought all the homes that they wanted to buy. I knew that he was going to be retiring soon and that he owned a very significant percentage of his company. And so we went back to him and we said, okay, honestly, don't give us cash. We would love your cash, but don't just give us cash. Let us put in front of you that there are some other options that actually probably would benefit you. We can still receive the same powerful gift, but there's more that you can accomplish in terms of preparing for your retirement and preparing for how you want to set your family in good stead. Um, as this slide says, these are really just very simple. They're here to outline complex gifts um, and then to resource these donors. Um, if you want to do math, you are welcome to do that. Um, there are ways to do that, but this is a much more pared down version of a gift illustration. It's really showing in estimate, if you make this kind of a gift and you have this kind of a cost basis, here's what you can maybe estimate being your tax deduction and your potential savings. These are calculations that are not rocket science calculations. Um, and, and like I said, often can actually be done if you find a free calculator on another nonprofit's website. Hannah, I flew through that. Let me pause and see if there's anything that you have to add as well. I know you've done a lot of these. No, I, I think you did a great job demonstrating all of the different ways we can incorporate uh, various calculations or illustrations of how gifts can make an impact, not only for charity, but also benefit the donor. So Absolutely. I'm going to talk next, uh, talk through a case study next, which is is a real example um, of, of a, a donor and, and their experience really understanding what type of charitable impact they can have based on, on their own uh, personal circumstances. So I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that we'll, we'll demonstrate through this case study. This case study focuses on one donor that one of our colleagues, Christopher, has been working with. And it follows two proposal conversations. The initial ask was for an asset-based gift and then a more detailed proposal that was presented after learning more from the donor and really understanding the additional needs that the donor had. To respect both the donor and the nonprofit, we did change the donor's name and we received permission from the Colorado Plan Giving Roundtable to use their organization as the example charity. Um, some of the additional information uh, that will be presented was also anonymized. Um, so if you do have questions, feel free to let us know. Um, but I do want to highlight that uh, this particular donor, one thing that we really love about this case study is that this is a middle income donor. This is your average person. This is a consistent donor. She is a widow in her mid 70s. We're going to call her Margaret. Uh, Margaret was considered a good candidate for a gift of non-cash assets uh, because she had been making contributions through her um, through her retirement accounts. She and her late husband had been founding members of the organization and had been making regular contributions for over 35 years, which also included a pledge to a capital campaign. The donor also has uh, two adult children. So one, I did mention that she began uh, making annual contributions through her qualified charitable distributions. And that's what really uh, triggered the organization to, to understand that she might be advised by a financial planner or a tax accountant on how to maximize her philanthropic giving. The charity also knew that this donor owned a few rental or a few real estate properties, which included a rental investment property. The management of this rental property had been becoming a burden and the donor was considering moving in the coming years. So a lot was being taken into consideration uh, just based on, on 
understanding the donor and the relationship that they had with the charity. And in this case, I also want to share that the donor had been talking with a planned gift advisor who uh, created or demonstrated a mindset that philanthropy as a concept could be considered uh, one of her children as she was thinking about her estate and, and who she would leave her assets to. Um, so she wanted to leave assets to her adult children, um, but she also wanted to be sure that she was thinking uh, about charity as well in her future giving. Um, so that was an important piece um, of information. As we look at the next slide, we wanna talk about the strategy. Um, so the donor had attended a planned gift seminar that the nonprofit had hosted in, in, a, in some of the prior years. The organization was already thinking about a blended gift request and was thinking about how that might be a good way to start a conversation about gift of assets. Because this donor had been a founding member of the organization, and she and her husband had made those capital campaign contributions um, to help with a, a facility expansion. The charity was not currently in a campaign, nor did they have plans to launch a campaign in a few years, but they're anticipating that their aging building um, was going to need some repairs in the years ahead. And they wanted to make sure that they were forward thinking and, and establishing funds to really help offset some of those future costs. So the organization was thinking that perhaps an endowment gift to support those deferred maintenance needs might appeal to the donor. So we, the, the nonprofit presented a proposal. As we describe the proposal, um, I, I want to, to note that the next couple of slides you'll see uh, look orange. They have an orange uh, uh, color palette. Imagine that these slides were printed out and presented to the donor by the nonprofit as a physical packet of information. That's just a little bit difficult for us to demonstrate on a webinar, um, but we want to, to let you know that this was a, a printed piece that was given to the nonprofit and certainly look, or given to the donor rather, and certainly looked different. We just uh, changed uh, some of the information for this webinar. On the next couple slides, we'll also have some gold call-out boxes. Those are notes for all of you attending today. Those were not part of the proposal. So in this first conversation, uh, the development officer presented the blended gift proposal. They, this proposal really explained the current needs and accomplishments of the organization, uh, which is a best practice and something that all, organ all nonprofits should do. This, this proposal also put a highlight on the long-term vision and goals of the organization to really build a case uh, for the gift of non-cash assets that they were seeking. We think that donors with a longer history with the organization may want the, the freedom to explore the vision of the organization together. So talking about that long-term vision and really demonstrating how the donor can help to impact that is, is something that we think is, is really beneficial. As you're thinking about putting together your own proposals, make sure that you're providing context for the request, demonstrate the needs that the donor will address, share that big vision and goals, and then articulate how the donor can help to meet those goals. And these are things that Christiana also already shared. So the next slide is actually the blended gift proposal that was initially presented to the donor. Again, this was a middle income donor who could really benefit from good planning, not only to save on taxes, but also make the charitable impact that she wishes to have. The charity knew enough to suggest that Margaret might consider a gift of real estate, but not enough about Margaret or her real estate assets to suggest a specific gift strategy. So they were really thinking about this as, as a preliminary ask and to put forth the idea that real estate could be something that could really benefit uh, the charity and also address some of, some of Margaret's needs. This gift request illustration was left fairly open uh, with, an, with a supporting table that was provided at the end of the conversation that em emphasized uh, many of the different gift options that real estate could provide. 
the amount that was identified, that $150,000 gift of real estate, uh, worked out to, um, was, excuse me, was identified to create a permanent endowment gift. So the organization could perpetually draw 4% um, of that investment to, to cover her $6,000 annual cash contribution, or not cash contribution, but rather a QCD contribution that she's already uh, giving to the organization. So essentially, they're asking for a current gift of cash every year, plus that future $150,000 a real estate gift that would be invested in an endowment and return $6,000 a year back to, uh, in this case, the Colorado Plan Giving Roundtable. So as um, Margaret, what, one thing that the organization did not shy away from um, in, in seeking this gift from Margaret was really painting that picture of both the need uh, now, as well as the long-term and future vision needs of the organization. It's really important to talk about that long-term impact um, because people want to make planned gifts to nonprofits that are stable and have bold future aspirations. Um, so they left Margaret with, with this information to really think about what, what she might be willing to do or interested, to do, interested in doing. One of the other pieces that they also left behind was a, a table um, that Christiana demonstrated earlier, but was also designed specifically for the charity um, and for Margaret to think about the various gift vehicles. This particular leave behind really surprised Margaret and made attainable uh, to her the various ways a gift of real estate could be used. This table ultimately helped her to rule out a few strategies that she said she wasn't interested in which further confirmed for both Margaret and the charity which, which types of gifts she was interested in. Margaret did immediately rule out a direct gift, largely because she wasn't ready to make a gift in the current year. We didn't yet know why. Um, did she want income or did she want to give more over time? Or maybe it was something on the charity side um, she wasn't a leader necessarily within the organization, but she was a long time involved with the organization. But we, we heard her, we heard her say a direct gift of real estate wasn't something she wanted to do. She also said that she didn't want to leave a bequest, largely because there was no tax benefit. So she wanted to maximize her giving during her lifetime. And then she also ruled out a retained life estate largely because she just didn't want the property anymore. So this table really helped Margaret to, to determine what might be next uh, for her and for the charity. And they were, the Margaret and the charity were in conversation uh, throughout this whole process. So the second step after the charity got this additional information from Margaret was to come back with a set of illustrations that really detailed her gift options. And that's what we'll demonstrate next. Great. So we made clear to Margaret um, that the illustrations provided in the, in the proposal were both informational and uh, informal. So we wanted her to really uh, think about taking this information back to her professional advisors um, so that we, we just wanted to be really clear um, that the information provided was not does not replace the advice of those personal professional advisors who are experts in these areas. And so as you think about this, also consider whether it's appropriate to join conversations with their donor and their professional advisors um, as the nonprofit liaison or to invite those professional advisors into the conversation with you and Margaret. Um, but what they what this organization did was was present uh, a few different illustrations for Margaret to take back to her professional advisors. Um, the first option was a gift of real estate. I'll reiterate, we knew that this option was not aligned with what Margaret wanted to do, but this really served as a baseline for the other gift vehicles she was considering. So we just wanted to, to show her and demonstrate the reason why this wasn't the right gift for her to make at the time. Um, 
So with her gift of real estate, it turned out that the estimated property value was $130,000. It wasn't the $150,000 that we had initially asked for or anticipated in the first proposal. So that's where this estimated, that's where some additional information helped us to really hone in on that $130,000 property value. She'd been considering the sale of this uh, rental property that she bought with her husband many years back. It had a cost basis of around uh, $20,000. Her accountant had run some numbers and based on her tax situation, said it would be taxed uh, at long-term capital gains taxes. And Margaret's property was in the state of Minnesota. Capital gains there are taxed at regular income tax rates. And these taxes, um, significantly reduce the proceeds of the property from the $130,000 fair market value to about $98,000, um, which, which for her was quite disappointing. That wasn't going to be the amount of a gift that she really wanted to give to the organization. Um, again, these this was estimates. This was from uh, 2023. So these numbers might have changed in the last year, um, but note this, this is just for demonstration purposes today. Um, so what this what this particular slide did was to really establish a baseline of what potential options were available um, to the donor, and we'd really encourage Margaret to review that with her trusted advisor. Um, but she knew, and we knew, that this wasn't a type of gift uh, that she wanted to make. We also knew that a gift of real estate was something that she didn't want to do, but we included it anyway to, again, provide her with a baseline for that philanthropic gift. Um, a gift of real estate, so if she deeded the property directly over to the charity, uh, would provide a, a much higher um, contribution to the organization, so up about uh, $20,000 um, from the sale of, of, the, of the real estate property, um, but it really wasn't uh, what she wanted, um, largely because she she felt like there was other ways that she could give that would be more meaningful to the charity. So the third gift option that was presented was a donor advised fund. And while, while it might be controversial for a charity who doesn't offer donor advised funds to present that as a gift option, the charity was really thinking about what would be most beneficial to the donor and what could also help to benefit and support us in the end. This was initially Margaret's top pick, and it really seemed like it would be, it, it was going in that direction, largely based on the tax benefits that she would receive and the flexibility that she would have to give to multiple organizations. So this illustration was uh, generated in a way that we thought was pretty clear. It moves through the years, starting at, with the gift to the DAF at initiation. We had the idea that Margaret would be able to fund some of her lifetime giving from the donor advised fund while leaving the charity as the designated beneficiary of the donor advised fund at the end of her life. We spelled out these assumptions in the illustration showing what it would look like if she made her annual gift for 10 years, so that's $6,000 that she's already giving, and provided a projection of what would be left over at the end of 10 years. Then there was a bit of a surprise. We found that what seemed to be a small detail ended up changing the course of planning. Margaret um, was excited about this idea, but she went back to the charitable arm of the brokerage that she worked with personally, who directed her to their complex gift specialist. And she was surprised about how high the DAF fee was for a gift of real estate. There at the brokerage that she was uh, utilizing, there was a minimum DAF fee of $10,000 in addition to the normal closing costs for the sale of property. The DAF ended up being higher at her property value. And if the property was larger, the fee would be lower on a percentage basis. This might not be the case for all DAF providers, but this was the experience that Margaret had. So with that upfront fee taken out, the savings just didn't look as good for her. And our projection was based on a simple compound return of 5.5% a year, 
removing that $6,000 gift uh, a year to charity. And so in 10 years, that one's going to leave her with about um, roughly $102,000 that she would be able to give to charity at the end of her life. Um, the DAF was going to allow her to continue her annual giving and, um, in, and enable her to make that charitable gift at the end of her life as well. So another option that she considered, understanding the DAF had those high fees, uh, was a charitable gift annuity. We thought it uh, would provide some great income, tax benefits, as well as a gift to charity. However, during the conversation, it became clear that this particular gift just didn't appeal to Margaret. We learned that uh, she had some health concerns, that she just really wanted some more flexibility with her, with her assets. So the CGA didn't have that flexibility to design the gift as much as other gift strategies. She didn't feel um, as involved signing up for a gift annuity. She felt it was a little more transactional. And she really wanted the option to make active choices with the leadership of the charity and with the overall gift at the remainder. Um, so this particular gift, while the payout rates were good, there was less donor control with this giving vehicle, especially as the donor was considering her health and future needs. And for this particular illustration, uh, we did use a crescendo calculator, which incorporated state and federal taxes. So the third or the final gift option that we presented was a charitable remainder trust. Margaret was disappointed by the DAF, uninterested in the CGA. So her attention really turned here. We ran a projection of a charitable remainder annuity trust for simplicity. This is also called a CRAT uh, for short. The CRAT provided uh, $6,000 of income at a payout rate of 5%. It was also projected to leave a great charitable gift and estimated to avoid the capital gains, uh, gain taxes, and provide nearly $21,000 in income tax savings. Margaret really liked that she could sell the asset, her real estate, at the right time and control the, the investments uh, that the asset would generate within the trust. She had heard that CRATs were cumbersome to set up. However, she scheduled a meeting with a lawyer and the, the company or person that she worked with found that it only cost about $2,000. So for her, Margaret really liked getting that tax deduction up front and having some personal income over time. It also paired really well to recognize the tax benefit in this current year uh, with her giving strategy through her qualified charitable distributions from her retirement assets. She didn't want to commit everything to charity, but was really, really happy with the projections. And you can see in the end, she's giving about $135,000 as her charitable contribution uh, to the organization, which was really what she was looking to do was give a larger gift uh, to the organization over time. Throughout this whole process, um, Margaret talked to at least six different ex experts about the gift strategy. Her, it was her accountant, her investment advisor, a representative at the charitable arm that handles non-cash assets, her estate lawyer, and a charitable trust-specific lawyer, as well as the gift planner at the charity. So it was quite a process, really working with Margaret and helping her to understand what might be the best uh, circumstance based on her situation. Margaret is still in the process of inking the deal, but in the end, she is leaning toward a flip cut for 10 years that will fund a donor advised fund. She hopes to have the flexibility later in life to make some charitable gifts, but the donor advised fund will name uh, the organization as the designated beneficiary should something happen to her sooner. One of the other things that Margaret realized in this process was that she has a lot of power in giving through her annual qualified charitable distributions. We think that she's going to lean in on giving from these funds in the coming years when she really wants to increase her philanthropic giving. So ultimately, while this was quite a long process and, and took a number of different conversations with a variety of professional advisors and trusted partners, uh, Margaret and the charity are in a really good place, uh, and, and she's becoming an advocate uh, for the organization and for these uh, types of non-cash gifts. 
So that was a lot of information presented in the case study. Um, and there was a lot of work that went into the conversation with Margaret. There's preliminary preparation that does need to be done uh, by the fundraiser in preparation for the donor meeting, before meeting with any of the donors advisors, and to prepare any additional partners at your organization who might be supporting the conversation. Um, so we wanna share a few tips and tricks that we think are helpful in getting started for discussing proposals and, and gift illustrations. So what do you need to do before going into this meeting? First, prepare. This is so critical before any donor meeting to research, really refresh yourself on who the donor is, um, what they care about, outline meeting objectives. I like putting together talking points and practicing in advance because that really helps me feel confident um, before I go into a meeting with a donor. When you are meeting with a donor, we have to remind ourselves that we're the experts of our organization. Um, so avoid jargon. We have so many funny words. I use crat, we use crut, we use dafts. Uh, donors don't understand all of that. Um, so really utilize language that is clear and plain. Uh, this is in the, the donor meeting that you wanna make sure that that you are really talking about, talking in ways that resonate with the donor that you're meeting with. And understand that you might have to go back and forth multiple times with a donor before they make a decision. Keep the door open for them to utilize you as a resource in this decision-making process. The other type of meeting that we'll have to prepare for is any meeting that you might have with the donor's advisors. Um, and this, this conversation may look a little bit different. Professional advisors have different relationships with their clients um, than nonprofits do with the same people as their donors. So it's really important to respect the relationship and any private information that may be provided in those conversations. Recognize that these professionals have a different type of expertise than we do as fundraisers. and recognize that expertise and demonstrate how various gift options also impact the charity in which you work for. Working together is really going to help yield the most uh, positive and productive results for everyone. And lastly, we often have partners at our nonprofit organizations who help to support these conversations. So make sure that your partners in philanthropy are also properly prepared based on their roles. If a partner's joining the meeting, they'll need more background information. They may need insights on cultural competency if they're not as aware of, of who the donor is that they're meeting with. It's best to assign roles so that everyone in the meeting is on the same page and the, the objectives of the meeting are met. It's even good to practice those roles or, as I mentioned earlier, create talking points so that people uh, within in your organization know the, the specific role that they should be playing with that individual donor. And before we get this far, we probably should have also reviewed our gift acceptance policies to ensure whatever gift we're asking for is aligned uh, with what our organization can accept. It's also important to be a resource to your colleagues who are doing the background work in accepting this gift. Understand what they need to be successful, which is also a really critical part of donor stewardship. So if it's a complex gift, what might your gift acceptance team need to uh, really thank that donor to ensure that the gift is accepted and acknowledged properly um, and support them throughout this process? One of the, so we're just about wrapped up with our presentations. Um, I'm gonna pause for one, one moment. Excuse me. Um, one thing that I wanted to share was, was an example of, of a donor that I've been working with recently. This particular donor um, came, to, came to, to give a gift of $100,000. 
it was a cash gift that he was really excited and honored to make. And we were so excited and honored to receive this particular gift. And when I asked the donor in, in passing, I thanked the donor in passing, I said, hey, donor, what? Um, tell me a little bit more. Why are you giving this gift in cash? And he said, well, we need cash right away. We have a capital campaign and, and we need this gift to impact our, our efforts. I said, absolutely. That is so great. Have you thought about giving that gift through your IRA instead? And the donor paused and, and said, could I give a gift through my IRA? And I said, yes, absolutely. That may be far beneficial for you than giving a gift of cash alone. The donor went back, uh, met with his, his financial advisor, and ultimately changed the gift to be a gift uh, from his IRA. He's now giving $100,000 a year through his IRA for the next five years. So that gift really uh, was elevated. And it came from just asking the simple question of, hey, have you thought about this? Um, sometimes it's those little, little, little questions, those little pieces of curiosity that can open up the door to really secure some significant contributions. So I, I encourage anyone to really be curious with your donors and um, ask them those questions that that you need. Christiana, do you have other closing thoughts or reactions? I, I love this case study and I think we do have a couple of questions. Maybe we can just peek at the chat really fast before we let folks um, before we let folks go. I know we want to give you a couple minutes back. Hannah, one question on Margaret. Was there a reason she liked the fixed payment of the CRAT over the variable payment of a CRUT? I believe the reason that she liked the fixed payment of the CRAT um, was because she liked the consistency of knowing how much money she was going to be receiving as a donor. Ultimately, I, I did share that she was looking at, um, excuse me, a CRUT at the end. And what I'd like to do if, if we're able is in our follow-up, excuse me, provide insights um, as to where, where the donor's at today um, to see if anything else has changed and if she's actually finalized that gift decision. So I hope we can do that in our follow-up afterward. I think we also can look at adding a potential sixth scenario. I see several people asking about a bargain sale. That's a great call out. It's definitely something to be thinking about when you see real estate come on the conversation table. Um, so we'll look into if we can add um, another illustration for real or for, for um, bargain sale. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. I'm gonna let Christiana close as I seem to have something in my throat right now. <laughs> All Thank good, you. Hannah. All good. We are so grateful that you chose to join us today. Uh, I see many, many questions. If we're going to get the slides, we're happy to share those with you. Happy to share a recording. Um, and of course, if you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to us and um, we'll take all the Q&A and we'll send that out with our slide deck too. So thanks again for joining us. We appreciate your time and we'll see you at the next webinar. Take care, everyone.